I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? chance the opportunity to walk into the into um the tomb today or walk into several tombs but just when we walked in it was just it was so beautiful it was grand it's everything that you're saying but the thing that we noticed the most and could appreciate was the attention to detail literally you have all these little pieces that you have to figure out where they went to and then place them on each one. So it's not like you just slapped them up there and said, okay, let's put this here and let's put this there. Talk to us about that process. Sure. Well, uh, the, the specific tomb that we're working on for reconstructive purposes is the tomb of Karakamin, which collapsed in the 1990s. And the pillars, which were inscribed with text and images, just crumbled into the earth. So as we uh, excavate, we find fragments the fragments have to be registered, they have to be photographed, and then put in storage until we finally excavated the entire area, cleaned the area, and now we're in the uh, restoration phase of the project. So we found over 32,000 fragments, and each fragment uh, contains either text or image, and so we know uh, pretty much what text was on which pillar in which hall within the space, and it's simply a matter now of piecing the fragments of a specific pillar uh, together in such a fashion that we can begin to assemble them. And we have a, a wonderful team of conservators who are doing this work. We have one person who just finds the joints. He finds pieces of fragment that fit together based on the text, based on the color of the stone, and he fuses them together. And then we have another group of conservators who would then take those fragments and then insert them into the newly reconstructed pillar. And that's what we've been doing. And we've done an incredible job of finding joins and then reattaching joins. And Kwakamin's temple tomb is literally coming alive each and every day. Uh, we breathe more life into the space. And what I like to think is that as we are restoring his tomb, we're restoring the memory and the consciousness of this man and we're making it possible for his spirit to come back to the place where mm. uh, he was to live for eternity. And if you can just imagine, you saw the site today. So we have four primary tombs that we're working on. Each belong to an individual, a Kushite individual who died. And then after his death, his tomb was usurped by someone else. So we have multiple people who have lived in this space. So as we are in the process of restoring these tombs, we're giving life to these people. So if you can imagine the spirits of those ancestors mm. now in this space, you know, telling us where to dig to find more fragments or what pieces join together, rebuild my sacred space so that I can come and be with you mm. again. That's what's happening. That's what yes. the Ace of Restoration Project is all about. Wow. And it's not like you have just like 10 people working. You have over 100 people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this man is modest. <clears throat> Listen, and I'm, we're going to keep saying this throughout this piece, is that people need to give money. And they don't need to talk about it or say, oh, you know what? Um, oh, I like what you're doing. Oh, good job. And I'm sure you like when people say that. However... To, to, if you were able to see what we saw, which you can, because you can just get your ticket, come where you had to sign up for um, a tour um, through Anthony Browder to see it with your eyes, you know, to see it. But if you saw what he was doing and how important this is for our souls, you would give your money. And this is very important. This, this, this is not free. 
Um, these people are not like, oh, I just love this. And so let me just, you know, do it out of the kindness of my heart. It takes money. <clears throat> so please go to his website. It's, um, it's www.ikg-info.com. That's www.ikg-info.com. <laughs> yes. Cash app. They do cash app. Cash app on your phone, slide, Vimno, PayPal, all of it. They take everything. Okay. And then so, the reason why that's important is that when we started off, um, it cost us $10,000 a month with four months, that's $40,000 a year. As we have expanded our mm -hmm. presence here, we've gone from $40,000 a season to $60,000 a season to $70,000 a season to $80,000 a season. And now for the last three seasons, we've spent approximately $100,000. Why? Because as we find artifacts, we now put them in the museum. So we have to pay for the exhibition. We have to put everything together. So we've been spending the last three years uh, $100,000 a year. We've got over uh, 125 people on the payroll. They get paid every Thursday. So we pay their salary. We, we have to pay their tips. We pay a portion of what we pay goes toward their insurance. And then we've got other, we've got materials, we've got supplies. We've got yes. other things that, um, that fund this work. So the important thing about this is, is this. Last year in 2019, the Egyptian Antiquities Department issued 240 permits for foreigners to, to work in Egypt. 239 of them were sponsored by white organizations, universities, major institutions that receive hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to do their work. We're the mm -hmm. only African American funded excavation in Egypt, the only one. And it was structured in such a way that I wanted, I wanted our people to, to, to feel a sense of pride in helping to fund this excavation helping to bring our ancestral history alive. Yes. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to deal with uh, corporations. I didn't want to deal with other institutions because they would want to take ownership of that. This is, this is our history. So we have an obligation, we have a responsibility to restore our past like everyone else restores their past. And if you think about it, everybody's here. The Polish are here, the French are here, the Germans are here, the Russians are here, the French are here, the Americans are here. Everybody's here in Egypt. Why? Because this is where it started. And this is where the greatest evidence of human accomplishment in the history of the planet is. That's why they're here, and Egypt is in Africa. So it makes sense that African people should be here too. Absolutely. It makes sense that we should be funding this ourselves so that we can tell the story and reconstruct the history of a people who John Henry Clark said were all too often written out of the respectful commentary of human history. Okay, so your um, your artifacts are in the Luxor Museum here in Waset, Luxor, for those that don't know. Um, how did you choose the Luxor Museum, or did they choose you? Well, at the time, the former director of the Luxor Museum was a colleague of my, my colleague, Lena Pristakova, and she was looking for additional items to put in the museum because there were a number of items in the Luxor Museum that were taken to Cairo uh, to Giza, actually, for the Grand um, uh, Grand Egyptian Museum, which mm -hmm. is going to be opening soon. So there was a vacancy, and we were uncovering things. As a matter of fact, in 2018, we had just found a set of canopic jars. So she offered us a showcase to display the canopic jars. We did that in the summer of 2018, and then 2019, we had a larger showcase and we put in a exhibition that showcased 104 different artifacts that covered uh, the 13 years of excavation at that time. So we had things from the 25th dynasty, we had things from the Greek period, we had things from uh, the Coptic period. So it just covered a wide spectrum of uh, the artifacts that were found at our Christite site that had been occupied by a number of people over the course of uh, several hundred years. So, okay, so let's back up. Um, so you're doing this under the Asa Hilliard Restoration Project. And so first, talk to us a little bit about who Asa Hilliard was right. and why did you decide to name this restoration project after him? Right. Well, uh, Asa Hilliard was a dear friend of mine and one of my role models, as, as Atlantis mentioned, uh, as she will mention, I'm, I'm projecting into the future. When you talk to her, <laughs> she'll tell you that um, uh, I never knew my biological father. And so one of the things that I did when I began to cultivate an interest in, in history was to identify historians who had the qualities that uh, I wish my father had. 
and he passed on to me. So I grafted <laughs> um, uh, myself onto A.C. Hilliard. I grafted myself onto John D. Jackson. I grafted myself onto John Henry Clark. So I met Dr. Hilliard in 1980, 1981, and was just impressed with uh, his scholarship. And he's just a kind, loving soul, mm -hmm. a really wonderful person. And um, Asa wrote the introduction to my first book, From the Brow to File. And he died in, uh, in Egypt at a conference that was held in um, 2007. And so his death came as a, as a shock to me and everybody who knew him and loved him. So one of the things that I learned over the years is that uh, in order to keep the memory of ancestors alive, you name things after them. So I was here in Egypt uh, the year after he died. I had just met Alina, had just been introduced to her by a colleague of mine and saw her excavation. She was two years into the project, had run out of money and she was about to shut it down because she couldn't move any further. And I said, well, you know, I, I know a few people and, and, and I got a little money, I'll, I'll raise money for the project. So once I committed myself to doing that, I then searched for a name. So the area where we're excavating is uh, South Asasif. The mountain range is called the Asasif Mountains, A-S-A-S-I-F, A-S-A, Asa, Asa, the Asa Restoration Project. Oh, so that was, the, that was the idea. Wow. And I kind okay. of thought through uh, the formulation of, of the project. And once I formulated my thoughts, I went to, I called up Asa's uh, wife, uh, Patsy, who lives in uh, Atlanta and, sh and shared with her my idea and said that I wanted to uh, go to Atlanta to meet with her. Okay, so you went to Atlanta to talk to Asa Hilliard's wife, Patsy, and mm -hmm. then what happened? Uh, I met with um, Patsy Jo Hilliard, the former mayor of East Point, Georgia, I believe, and, and her son, Hakeem, and laid out my idea, got their blessings, oh. and came back to Washington, D.C., and the Asa Restoration Project was born on September 21st, 2008. So we are the uh, fiscal agent for the South Ossessee Conservation Project. And uh, the project has grown steadily under my stewardship. Yeah. So uh, we had the awesome, and I say awesome time today. It was beautiful, um, wasn't it? It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful um, seeing his site. And I think that you're, um, you're, you're, it, Yes, it's awesome, but we got to talk details about this site because when I went, you know, I, I don't know what I expected to see, but what I saw was there's no way I could have even expected to see any of what um, what you had laid out. So um, let's first talk about how many things you've uncovered in terms of like um, tombs, like how many different sites. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just give you some context. Let's start off in 2006 is when Alina first began digging at the site. Uh, she had uh, read a book written in the 1970s that talked about um, three tombs in South Ossesif. And the tombs were covered over by a village. Uh, people would build their homes over where they suspected tombs were, and they would rob the tombs and sell the items in the tombs on the white market. So she had a general idea that uh, this lost tomb uh, tomb that was associated with this man named Karakamin was somewhere in this area. So she would come every day and inquire, you know, where are the tombs, where are the tombs? And folks would say, well, there's no tombs here, there's no tombs here. And then one day, uh, a kid uh, was angry at the chief of the village, Abdullah El Rasul, and dropped a dime on him. He's got a tomb in his house. So she goes over to his house and said, uh, you, you have a tomb, I want to see the tomb. I don't have a tomb, I don't, please let me see it. I, all I want to do is look at it. And so he said, well, look, I have a tomb, you have a daughter. How is your daughter? Your daughter's eight. Well, my grandson is six. Let my daughter, let your daughter marry my grandson and I'll show you my tomb. So she agreed to do that, wink, wink, wink. She agreed to do that. And then he took out a key and took him downstairs and opened the lock and stepped into the tomb. That was the tomb of Etieru. Wow. So once they saw the tomb of Etieru, then she knew based on uh, a map of the site that was done years before, that there was another tomb, the tomb of Krakamin, that was close by. And she scoped out the area, found a site where she thought his tomb may be, and hired some workers and started digging. And ultimately found traces of the ceiling 
and continued digging until she found uh, a the portion of the first pillared hall. And she was two years into that project when she ran out of money. At that time, it was costing her about $40,000 a year. She had run out of money, so she withdrew all the funds from her 401k. When she dried mm -hmm. that, exhausted that, she uh, maxed out her credit cards and then started tapping into her daughter's college tuition. And I met her when she was about to pull the plug on the project. Lena had reached the end of her rope and I agreed to step in and fund the project. That was in 2008, and we have been uh, funding the project for the past 12 years and have made a number of incredible discoveries. It, it appears as though each year we find something new um, that rewards us for having invested our time, our talent, and our treasure in, in working in the heat and in, in, in these uh, sometimes uncomfortable uh, conditions. And it also is the ancestors' way of in telling us that we've done good and inviting us to come back because mm. there will be more to be found the next season. That's how it's been going. And the last three seasons have, in, have gotten progressively better. And our goal is to restore the tombs at South Ossesif and to formally open them to the general public so that people will come to visit the first Kushite tombs built in Kemet the same way they come to visit Karnak Temple, Luxor Temple, and the Great Pyramids. Okay, so explain to us who Karakamin um, was and in relation to in relationship to like which dynasty? Sure. Like, yeah. Well, the tombs that we have are, are 25th dynasty tombs, and I refer to the 25th dynasty tombs as the last period of African uh, kings. So every great period of discovery and innovation in the history, the 3,000 year history of Kemet, was initiated by African kings. And so the 25th dynasty was what John Henry Clark often referred to as Africa's last great walk in the sun. It was the last time in the history of uh, the written record that African people were the mightiest rulers on the earth. So they ruled a little less than 25 years. Karakamin was, uh, Karakamin was a uh, fourth Ak priest of Amen at Ipedasit, Karnak Temple. Uh, we also have the tomb of Karabashkin. Karabashkin was a priest of Amen at uh, Ipedasit. And he also was the mayor of Waset. Waset was, at the time, Waset is the city that we now call Luxor and Karnak. Mm -hmm. Waset was, at, at that time, the capital, the cultural, po political, and spiritual capital of the world. And it had been for over a thousand years. So if we can present Waset in a contemporary context, Waset was Wakanda. It was a place to be for anyone in the world who wanted to gain an education, knowledge about astronomy or medicine or philosophy or spiritual traditions. This was ground zero for, for knowledge. And Karaboshkin's tomb was the first temple tomb built on the west bank of Luxor. And as the mayor of Waset, he also was an architect and was responsible for restoring the temple uh, of Karnak, the temple of Luxor, and the Avenue of the Sphinxes, which connects these two temples. Mm -hmm. And along with Karakamin <coughs> and Karakamin's brother, Nesamenepet, who was also buried uh, in a chapel within his tomb, and their <coughs> baby brother, another priest of uh, Karnak Temple, who also went on to become the chief priest at Karnak Temple. His name was Harry M. Aket. So these three men, Karakamin, Nesamenepet, and Harry M. Aket, were priests at Karnak Temple. And because of the size of Karakamin's tomb, the grandeur of Karakamin's tomb, he obviously was connected to the royal family. We now know that Harry M. Aket was the son of Shabaka. So more than likely, these three brothers were also princes. Uh, we haven't found the <laughs> documentation to substantiate that as far as Karakamin and Nesimenepet were concerned, but just looking at his tomb, uh, one has to know that he was connected to royalty. I mean, his tomb, just to give you some context, his tomb is four times larger than King Tut's tomb. And even though the tomb had been robbed in ancient times, what was left behind architecturally, it is more valuable than King Tut's tomb because we have um, we have two pillared halls. We have uh, texts from uh, the Book of the Hours. Uh, we have texts from the Book of Coming Forth by Day, the so-called Book of the Dead. And we have pyramid texts. Uh, we've got 
uh, more texts, more sacred literary texts in Karakamin's temple tomb than any late period tomb in Kemet. So these, this Kushite presence here in Kemet is important because it shows you that they were an extension of Nile Valley culture and civilization. Yes. So, so tell us about this. Well, this pyramidion was found in the court of a tomb that we uh, have been excavating for some time. And it's the tomb that was formerly associated with Itieru. But we knew that this tomb had been appropriated at some point during the 2026th dynasty. We were fortunate this season to find the name of the original occupant, Nesba Nedjeb. And then on the floor, in the northeast corner of the courtyard, we found this. Wow. So this object, this find, confirms what we have suspected for so many years, that this location in South Assisif, which was the site of the first Kushite tombs in Kemet, was also the site of the first Kushite pyramids in Kemet. Confirmation. The artifacts are in the Luxor Museum, the Primidium. How does that relate to the Kushites? Sure. Well, what we found um, about a month ago was a pyramidion, which is the capstone to a pyramid. It is a sandstone object, which reinforces the belief that we had at the site that uh, what we have at South Assisif is a recreation of El Kuru in Kush. El Kuru was a pyramid field where royal tombs were. There's over a hundred pyramids there. And what the, uh, what the um, Kushites did when they came to Kemet was to recreate that which they were familiar with. Mm -hmm. So Karabashkin was the first Kushite to be buried in Kemet. And it made sense that he would have a, a pyramid over his tomb. The same thing with uh, Karakamin. We've not found their pyramids yet, but the discovery of the Pyramidion in the sun court of Nesbenedjit uh, is significant because we now have evidence that there were pyramids here. And so what we're going to be doing next season is to be working on the superstructure and to find the footprint of these pyramids so that ultimately we can rebuild the pyramids just as we have rebuilt the tombs. So that's going to be the expansive part of the Ace of Restoration Project. Every year this thing grows beyond our wildest expectations. And, and the idea was people create their homeland wherever they go. If they're grounded in the history, culture, science, philosophy, and language, they recreate their homeland wherever they go. So when the Kush came, uh, Kushites came into Kemet, they brought part of Kush with them. So it's natural that we would have a pyramid, right? Yeah. It's natural that we would have pyramids. It's natural that we would have their images painted on the um, walls of their tombs. Yeah. They recreated home, which is what conscious people do. Yes, yes. So um, then you found a lot of interesting things. Anything you want to share? <laughs> we found some other artifacts that helped to, to, to identify other people in the tombs that we have been working in. So we found a stella, we found a box with uh, canopic jars, and an important discovery today, we found a portion of a coffin with the name of Etieru. Why is that important? It's important because uh, the tomb, the third tomb that we have been working in, uh, is a tomb of a woman named Itieru, but she was from the 26th dynasty. And we knew that she had usurped this other tomb, but we didn't know the name of the Kushite owner. Well, we found his name this season. His name is Nesbanetjet. And it's while we were excavating uh, or, or cleaning, removing debris in the court of Nesbanetjet that we found the Pyramidion in the northeast corner. So again, it's, it's, it's these ancestors just dropping these historical breadcrumbs saying, we got something over here for you that's gonna get you excited wow. and, 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 and keep you going for another week. We got something here that's gonna keep you coming back. So we've got, we found this treasure trove 
of, of items that now allow us to more closely identify the individuals who lived and died here. And it's going to continue to expand. I mean, that's how the process has grown over the past 14 years that Alina and I have been working together. So what year did you find it? Like, do you remember the month and the year of your first, like when you did your first find? Not when you had it exhibited, but like when you, when you guys found the first thing. When well, was that? We're finding things all the time, uh, big things and small things. Mm -hmm. But the most important year for me was um, July of 2010 when we found the steps leading to the burial chamber of Karakamen. And then in August of that same year uh, was when uh, Atlantis and I climbed 30 feet down the shaft into wow. the burial chamber where uh, we have that iconic photograph of the two of us standing on top of a pile of rubble with an image of Newt on the ceiling painted. Yes, the yes. That was That was a moment that I'll never forget. Wow. So now, so let me see, that's been about 10 years now. So, so tell us what's going on now in terms of the Luxor Museum and what you have showing, you know, what you're showing now. Well, we're constantly finding artifacts and it's uh, a blessing that we have a place to showcase some of the best finds thus far. So we've had, uh, have a wonderful relationship with the Luxor Museum and we trust that as we continue to find significant artifacts, there'll be a home for them here. Uh, right across the Nile from where we're excavating, we can show folk uh, the wonderful history of the first Kushite um, uh, work of noble men and women here in the Nile River Valley. Yes, and you know, it's uh, interesting, you were uh, talking before in terms of how many times you've been to Egypt and when you first started coming to Egypt. So can you just share with us about that? Like how many times you've been here? Sure, well, my first trip to Egypt with, was with uh, Dr. Ben. Uh, that was on November, excuse me, December the 23rd, 1980. We spent 13 days. And then this trip in December of 2020 makes my 60th trip to Egypt. Wow. Yeah, it, it, I would have never imagined. Uh, well, I never, could have imagined at that time that 40 years later I would be doing this. So to me, it's just a confirmation of what happens when you, you know, listen to the ancestors and follow their guidance and direction. Yeah. So you, so it's safe to say you think that everyone should come and visit Egypt. Everyone has to come and visit Egypt. This is the beginning of culture and civilization, the oldest documented civilization known to humanity. And it's here where you can literally walk in the footsteps of the mothers and fathers of culture and civilization and reconnect yourself with that part of our story which has been lost, which has been stolen, which has been hidden. And it's a transformative experience for those souls who come here ready to be transformed. When you started this, like, what, what were you thinking when you just started the project? Like, did you know what you were getting into? You know, did you Honestly, think? Honestly, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, I thought five years I'm in, I'm out, I'm out, I can go on and do other things. Twelve years later, you know, we're yeah. finding more tombs. We doubled the number of tombs this season. We started off uh, with four tombs. We now have eight tombs. Wow. Right? And we've got seven additional shafts. And in one of those shafts, we found the bodies of 22 people, 19 adults, two wow. teenagers, and one infant. And we've had a, a human bone specialist who was here examining uh, all the bones. And she has been able to verify that many of these people were part of one family. And many of the women in the family had a specific genetic disorder that they contracted during menopause. And she was able to identify uh, certain creases uh, within their brains that, that indicate the presence of this uh, genetic disorder. So we're slowly beginning to reconstruct the lives of these people who died here over 2,700 years ago. So, you know, uh, it's something that I never would have imagined in my wildest dreams that I would be involved in. I first came to Egypt 40 years ago. I had no idea that <laughs> 40 years later, I'd be 12 years into an archeological excavation. So for me, it just confirms two things. One, as Dr. Francis Chris Welsing said, everyone is born with a cosmic assignment. You come here 
with something specific that we are supposed to do. And when we do that thing, then the ancestors remove obstacles out of your way and create a path for you to accomplish your life's purpose. So it's clear to me now that this is my life's purpose. This is what I'm supposed to do. And when you do what you're supposed to do, um, obstacles dissipate. So while we have struggled at times for money, uh, money comes. Money comes because money is energy, right? Money, currency, uh, flow. Like the now, it has yeah. a current. The now yeah. flows, and the now sustains life. So the way that I understand all of this, and you know, we, we don't have to get, uh, as I see it, we don't have to get caught up in, 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 in all these profound spiritual things. It's, it, it, all of this is based on simple, basic understanding of forces of nature reciprocity, cause and effect, you know, and these natural rules represent principles, concepts, and ideas that are universal, that are timeless. And once you begin to understand them from a, a scientific point of view, a philosophical point of view, then you can begin to manifest these principles in everything that you do. So it removes obstacles because you are aligning yourself with the forces of the multiverse as Atlantis will say when you interview her. See, I'm looking into the future myself, you know? Uh, yes. So this stuff is happening. And, and that's how it works. Yeah. You know, so it's simply a matter of aligning yourself with, um, with the universe. It's a matter of aligning yourself with the ancestors who live through us. They live through us. Yeah. We are the vessels to which they, they speak. And they inspire us, inspired in spirit. So their spirit Ooh. comes inside of us. Yes. So it's simply yes. a matter of us being yes. quiet, listening to them, being obedient, and doing what we are instructed to do and do it with the knowledge that it's already done. You don't have to worry. You don't have to beg anybody for anything. You do it with the knowledge that it's going to be done. And so ultimately what you wind up doing is reaching into the future, getting everything you want, bringing it into the present moment and manifesting it. That's how they built these temples. That's how they built these monuments. They were tapped into a power source that we are only dreaming about right now. Mm. But when we free ourselves, when we free our mind, when we allow ourselves to disengage from this oppressive system that was created in order to keep us separated from this power, we naturally drift back into that which is our essence. And we, when we allow ourselves to become our authentic selves, we don't have to copy anybody. All we have to do is be the best Africans that we were born to be and the universe aligns itself with our thoughts and manifests those things that will allow us to literally recreate heaven here here on earth absolutely that's what they did and that's what we're doing yeah it's all one continuum yeah and let me tell you this because I know the time is tight and know you got to go and I'm going to say bye Felicia before you go <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know the the beauty of, of all of this is that we also found at another site, a 25th Dynasty tomb, I found the Sankofa symbol painted on the ceiling. I just wrote an article on it. It's going to be in uh, our newest publication. We have a publication coming out uh, early uh, next year in 2021 on the uh, exhibition. And in it, I talk about our uh, my seeing it painted on the ceiling. So what I'm working on now wow. is identifying the origins of this running heart shaped spiral motif that has been painted on several tombs beginning in, I think, the 18th and 19th dynasty. And I found it on two tombs in North Assasif. And so what I'm looking at is, is tracing the migration of this symbol from the Nile River Valley to the Niger River Valley. Yeah. And, 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 and this theory supports the work of Sheikh Atijok, Atefa Lubinga, uh, Abubakar Kalam, who stated that uh, West African culture migrated from the Nile Valley. So whenever people move, they bring their cargo of knowledge with them. And that uh, when I'm feeling and, and will be searching to, to document is that the Akan symbols, the Adinkra symbols that are part of the Akan tradition, originated in the Nile Valley. 
the Akan themselves say that their ancestors came from the Nile Valley. And so now I'm looking for brothers and sisters who live in West Africa to document the story of their ancestry so that we can piece together this migration mm. from the Nile to the Niger. And the beautiful thing about that is, and this is where all of this is going, this is why we're here in South Ossetia doing this work, unveiling this work, because it's going to lead to an even greater unveiling in the years to come. So we can, if we, once we prove this migration from the Nile to the Niger, then we can begin to look at the theft of millions of African people from the Niger to the Potomac, to the Hudson, to the Mississippi. Mm. And so we can now say that the people who were stolen during the Ma'afa, whose ancestral memory was stripped away, those people carry within their DNA the memory of those ancestors from the Niger and the memory of those ancestors from the Nile. So as I like to think of the work that we're doing by restoring the memory of the ancestors uh, the Kushite and Kemetic ancestors here in, in, in Luxor, in South Ossetia, we're giving voice to those ancestors who now will have bodies in the present moment that they can work through to help us remember. And with that memory, we can begin the process of reclaiming that which was illegal, that which was erased, and then using this knowledge to rebuild the greatest culture and civilization that ever existed again. That's what's happening. Whether, whether we're really conscious of it or not, that is what's happening. And, and so if we project ourselves 50 years into the future, this is what people 50 years from now will say happened. This was the beginning yeah. of that process. So it's a matter of, of really expanding your consciousness and not limiting yourself to, to a past of a hundred and so years ago and, 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 and saying, oh, war is me, I don't have this, I don't have that. It's a matter of knowing that you have everything you need and acting with that knowledge and then manifesting everything you need right in your hands and then building on top of that. That's what's happening. That's what we're doing in South Ossetia right now. Well, we are gonna restore uh, the temple tombs in South Ossetia. And what that's gonna do is to give those ancestors who were buried here a home. It's going to allow their spirit to rise, which means mm. that the power that people will get from visiting these sites is going to be transferred to them, which means it's going to transform their consciousness, which means that we're going to see this, this reawakening of spirit that will be directed to do specific things, not following others who want to misdirect us, but know specifically who we are and what it is we must do. So if we follow that, then what we're actually doing is reconnecting ourselves to a larger cosmic cycle. It's a cosmic cycle that we will see here uh, with the winter solstice. The winter solstice where uh, at Karnak Temple, a Karnak Temple was aligned to sunrise on the winter solstice where it illuminates the central axis and the Holy of Holies of, of, um, of Ray. That's here in Karnak Temple. Three miles away across the Nile in the west, we've got Hatshepsut's Temple. And in the third terrace of Hatshepsut's Temple, that is also aligned to uh, the winter solstice sunrise. And so the sun, Ray, symbolizes life. Uh, the, the life-giving force that animates everything on the planet, everything within our known universe. And so it goes through this process every year. So it's an annual recognition of the source of life that lives within you. Just as coming forth by day is a daily recognition of the source of life that lives within you. So it's about realizing how everything is connected. And when you're connected to that source, there's nothing that you need that you won't be able to get. There is no fear, there's no loss. You're tapped into what I refer to as the eternal now, right? Mm. And all of the ancestors that we are disconnected from, all of uh, those people who will be born in the future, they all exist on a higher plane of consciousness. And when you're tapped into them, when you're tapped into that consciousness, you're tapped into the greatest force of energy, spiritual energy the world has ever known. That's what this place is all about. That's what the Nile Valley, that's what the Happy Valley is all about. And so the only way our oppressors can keep us under their thumb is to keep us disconnected from this power source. Once we tap in, 
game over. Game over. So 30 years from now, it's going to be a brand new game. The lesson is we have to be able to maintain and not make the mistakes in the past that resulted in our fall from power, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is cyclical. Everything follows specific yeah. patterns. So we have to learn the lessons from the past. That's what Sankofa is, is all about, mm -hmm. going back and reclaiming the knowledge of the past, the good and the bad, to learn from all the mistakes, to learn from all the successes, so that you can now build for eternity again. That's the lesson that's being repeated. And this whole thing is about repetition. So the solstice is repetition. The equinox is repetition. The rising and setting of the sun, the different phases of the moon is about repetition. Everything comes back. Everything is cyclical. We come back. You know, we don't just die. The physical body is temporary, but the soul is eternal. We come back to continue this journey. And so if you understand what Dr. Wilson said, you come back with a cosmic assignment, right? You're part of a continuum. And when you consciously tap into that continuum, there is nothing that you cannot do because simply there's nothing that you have not done. And here in the Nile Valley, we see the evidence of that. So it's about manifesting it. You know, it, it, it's, it's literally about bringing into existence that which you know will plug you into everything that has ever existed, everything that will exist, and you become this, this great personification of life. That's it. That's my story. I'm going to say it again. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> like I said, this is a comedian. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brower. You have been a tremendous in terms of sticking with us. We've been with you early morning all day. So I really appreciate you um, opening, um, opening yourself up, your sight, you know, um, uh, hanging with your daughter. And Darren, uh, just thank you so much for this. You're welcome, and thank you yeah. all. Thank you all for taking the initiative to to tell this story and to share this story with everyone who who needs to see it. And so yeah. now it's up to you. You know, don't just say, "Hey, I, I saw happy and it was happening." What are you going to do? Yeah. The information is about transformation. Yeah. And if you're not being transformed by this information, you wasted your time. We don't have time to waste. And once we understand that we're here for a purpose and we strive to fulfill that purpose, there's no obstacle uh, that we can't overcome. Ah, cosmic purpose. Wow. Yes, indeed. Yeah. That's it. That's what's up. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So um, you guys have heard Professor uh, Browder talk. It's very important that you support this project. Please go to www.ikg-info.com. And another important part of this component is that the Ace of Restoration Project is not simply about restoring uh, these temple tombs here on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt. It's also about restoring the consciousness of African people in the United States and all over the world. So we have this project, which my daughter Atlantis is the director of, and that is the uh, Cultural Imperative Initiative, where we have taken uh, the information from my books. My daughter has written this phenomenal curriculum, and we're now incorporating this information into high schools. So we're in about 12 different cities in the United States. So our goal is to create this pipeline. You know, folk have been talking about uh, the, the cradle to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. but we're, we're in the process of building a culture to consciousness pipeline, where we're taking young folk, exposing them to their ancient history and culture, and letting them know who they are and the potential that exists within them so that we can help steer them to colleges and universities and we can create the next generation mm -hmm. of architects engineers, scientists, Egyptologists, historians, scholars, designers, and they can step in yes. and continue the work that we're doing here, the work that needs to continue in Sudan, the work needs, that needs to continue in Ethiopia, the work that needs to continue all over the world where we have been. We need our people in the forefront doing that work. So the call to action is for parents to be responsible parents and make sure that you have libraries in your home and that you take time to teach your children to appreciate who they are as people of African ancestry, and then they act on that knowledge to, to continue engaging in the process of recre recreating the story of the greatest people who ever lived. Yes, and you know, I can't believe I forgot this. So listen, we wanted to, at Hoppy, um, donate to the Asa Hilliard Fund, so we're um, gonna cash app you because you take cash app, yes, you know. Um, $500 is just a beginning, but we, we really want to establish a relationship with you because this is really important. This is, this is, you are why we are here. 
it's like you said the same thing about everyone else but we're here because of you so thank you very much thank you i appreciate Aww. you all right oh Aww. thank you dear i know this is a oh <laughs> all right thank you <laughs> bye I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?